Welcome everybody. Uh, this is Into the Forest I Go. My name is Tom and today I'm going to be talking with Tomas Lima from Portugal, um, longtime member of Portuguese orienteering team, junior orienteering team first, then also senior orienteering team. He has been representing Portugal on World Orienteering Champs in 2021, 2022. He's also running for a Finnish club, MS Parma, and enjoying his races in Finland, Sweden, maybe also Norway, I'm not sure. Tiomila, probably Yukola as well. Uh, Thomas, welcome to the channel. Hi, Thomas. Thank you. Thank you for so, having me. Yeah, no problem. It's a pleasure from, from my side. It's uh, We've already had a discussion. Wow, it's been almost 40 minutes <laughs> uh, before we started the main part, and we you know, touched several interesting topics, how you started orienteering, uh, how your career has been from, from the junior years all the way to senior years. Some interesting, very interesting um, chats regarding the injuries that you had to go through and how they influence the mindset of runners, how to deal with those. But for this part, for the main part, I want to focus on um, maybe three different areas. So the first area I want to talk about is orienteering in Portugal in general. So I will be poking around trying to figure out why Portugal doesn't have top level athletes in a senior class. And you know, what's your perspective on this yet? Doesn't have them yet. Uh, that's of course important. Then I will also want to talk uh, a little bit about your gig at Jaywalk in Portugal, where you've been a speaker. I think it's a very interesting perspective uh, for many people to learn how the speaker job looks like uh, during a, a major event. And then if time allows, we will maybe also go into orienteering in Scandinavia and running for, for Scandinavia, Scandinavian clubs. We will see how, how, how it goes and how we'll be looking from, uh, uh, you know, from the time perspective. Sounds good? Yeah. All right. So, yeah, orienteering in, in Portugal. Let's start from, you know, some, some facts. Um, and, of course, if you don't know the numbers perfectly, just, you know, give us, like, uh, more or less or, or the best, most educated guest that you can have. How does orienteering in Portugal look like from the numbers perspective? How many people are doing orienteering, more or less? How many clubs do you have? How many events during the year do you have? Um, mm -hmm. I've certainly been visiting Portugal Portugal for many years in a row going to uh, Portugal a meeting. So that's the one I know, uh, but there's probably a lot more. Yeah, I would say that the orienteering in Portugal is maybe the most rich in the early months of the year when you have some world ranking events and a lot of uh, foreign clubs are coming for training camp there, enjoying the, the good weather we have all year round. Um, well, about the numbers, I would say that, yeah, at the, at the end of the year, we always have this big national championship, which is like everyone against everyone. And I would mm -hmm. say that in the most recent years, we have had like, between 300, 400 people competing in this. So since this is maybe like the biggest race of the year, that's uh, maybe the most accurate number of active orienteers that we have. Um, and I think it has decreased a bit after the COVID, maybe like in every other country, I don't know. Um, but I think that the biggest problem right now is the amount of young kids that we have running. It, they are just so few. Um, and I, I always saw it from, because after my generation, like two years younger, three years younger, there was no one coming after me and my my colleagues from same age. And we were like, who, who is going to replace us in the national young youth team? Um, and yeah, I think when you don't have a good uh, preparing base, like with I don't know, with teachers uh, teaching orienteering on, in school or clubs doing their work on having daily, weekly trainings at least, um, then you won't be f like filling the, the the scale all, all the time. Um, yeah, I, I would say that the most of the orienteers are nowadays like older, like from 40 years old and older. Um, and yeah, when I when I was also growing as a youth, there was this huge decrease in the number of elite runners. So 
uh, we had maybe no one to really look up to in mm -hmm. the in the senior class. Yeah, that, that can be a problem sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, why do you think it's difficult for for the clubs to recruit young runners? It's like the, the clubs are trying and there are just no uh, children that are interested in orienteering or is it is it because the recruitment process is, is bad for example mm. uh, it's it's a it's a difficult question i think some clubs have tried and i i remember in the past when i was still young and not not competing there was some interaction even between clubs like having common trainings and there was quite many young kids doing it at this time but then i think it can also have to be with the culture with, with the relation to nature with the nature and um for example i'm now in in czech republic and i see how much connected people are with with the nature like they go for a walk in the woods they yeah. they have campfires they, they they enjoy being being outside and in portugal you don't have this for example when i'm in some training camp and i have to stay at some friend's house they they, they are not orienteers and i say okay i will go for for the forest now for a run and then the parents and grandparents of my friends are always like, oh, but be careful with the wild pigs or don't don't go this way because it is dangerous. There will be the wolves and there are no wolves. And I don't know, it's, it just sounds strange to me that people are so afraid of going uh, into, into the forest or or just outside. So and then, of course, there is the other sports like Portugal is so strong in with the football and yeah. uh, even I think even... Um, some indoor sports are quite quite strong so and it's so much easier to go for a football match than to go for an orienteering race um you just have to get the ball some some poles and you you can have a match and for orienteering it's, it's not like this you have to have someone really dedicated on preparing the trainings on think, taking the kids uh, and usually not not just one person can be with the kids you need more more adults to be with them um, so it, it requires some effort that maybe people are not willing to take uh, to to help the kids learn the sport. Yeah, it's a very interesting topic for me as well because you know I am um, in a sport club as, uh, too, and uh, getting younger runners into into our club is also a challenge. And like actually, an interesting fact: so getting people into the club is not that difficult. But getting people into the club and make them do orienteering, running with the map, that is difficult, right? So if, if we organize like, okay, uh, the, the training sessions for kids, for example, that you go to the gym and there are some exercises, some games on the gym, and uh, it looks more like athletics rather than orienteering, no problem. You know, mm -hmm. lots of people are happy to bring their kids to this. But if it's about orienteering and getting the kid to the map and maybe going at to, for the training session during the weekend where you know we can do the map during the day that becomes a problem already you know and it's it's not that easy so i totally understand it and get it and i also want to comment on the thing that you said about the culture of czech people it is amazing right so we are neighbors neighbors with czech republic we visit czech republic quite often and it always amazes me you know how many people are outside over there doing all kinds of different sports all year round you know cycling mm -hmm. running skiing everything and when i've been to portugal i got the beta for example for several several times before the jaywalk and i went for a run or, or a hike in the mountains i usually didn't meet anyone hiking yeah. over there yeah also also nearby my city there are some some big mountains i think it's even like national park and I, I love so much to go there for long runs, like uh, trail running. And sometimes I do like 20, 25 kilometers running in the mountains and I don't see a single person. Exactly. And for me, it's it's so sad because it's so beautiful. It's so amazing to be out there, like good weather. And all I see is goats, uh, some wild horses. Uh, of course, for me, that's great. But I feel sad that no more people are are doing this. It's um, It's just sad. And... Also, my grandparents, they live uh, in the east side of the of the country, close to Spain. And I love to go cycling there. And I see no more cyclists. It's it's just me. Like, I do 60 kilometers ride. And the roads are in good condition. Like, even the, the dirt paths are perfect for mountain biking. 
and you see no one it's it's for me it's sad but of course i i love to be alone and i i know that it's always great but it's it's sad that no no one else is doing it that's true yeah, that's true all right coming back to orienteering in portugal so you have like for let's say 500 runners that are more or less active yeah um do you, do you know how many clubs do you have in portugal uh active ones Ooh. yeah i really don't know but maybe a bit over 20 okay. uh, I'm, I'm, but i'm really not sure so most the, of the, the clubs are probably not that big yeah we i can say we have at least like three bigger clubs right now there used to be maybe four or five but as i said after covid it was quite quite a mess but yeah maybe four big big clubs right now and then some smaller ones um but yeah okay no, so so no big competition between clubs no big competition between clubs that that is interesting yeah so you don't have anything like club national championships something like this we have like the relays um but again you you have only maybe one team per club um when you have one team so okay all right um, fair enough so earlier when we were talking you also said that the um uh, it's it's not really that hard to get to the national team because of the number mm -hmm. of people i'm guessing uh, that are trying mm -hmm. to, uh, to to compete for it but you know if you let's say that you are able to get to to the national team level how does or how how does it expand your training possibilities and opportunities when it comes to getting better as a you know national level junior yeah i think it increases greatly because i would say just two or three clubs are doing uh sort of uh, orienteering trainings in the weekend so then when you when you go for the for the national team you start having the training camps so that really can potentiate your your level um and i felt this when i when i started in the national team sometimes we were having like three training camps in five weeks and for me that that was great i i really i feel that that really helped me getting better as an orienteer um, so yeah, going from maybe one training every two months to having some training camps with the national team, that's already a big step and that can, can help. But then the problem is that for me, as I see it, it's so easy for the young kids to get to the national team that then I think, okay, I made it to the national team. I don't, I don't need to do more. Yeah. So then when you, of course, when you go to the international races, you, you are just, uh, yeah, smashed by by the outside guys, and it's sad to see that maybe the the, the younger ones don't have the they are not willing to to really try hard to to get better. Yeah, I've noticed this well in Poland sometimes for for some runners that uh, you kind of feel that you're good because you're able to win your age group. Mm -hmm. during the national level competition but then you go outside you know even just to Czech Republic and suddenly you're losing seven minutes to the to the winner which is like a <laughs> a huge gap when it comes mm -hmm. to let's say even the log distance you know but not even to mention the, the middle distance and that that gives you a perspective of okay so you know I have been training regularly and I'm here and the guys that I will have to compete during EOC or Jaywalk are you know, up here and there is this huge gap and I don't even know how to how, how, how to fill this gap because there is no one on, on like in between that gap inside mm -hmm. the group that I'm training with so it's, it's always hard to do it by yourself when you don't have anyone stronger that you can compare yourself to regularly yeah and, and it's about having someone to look up to as well if if you don't have some strong guy that is being able to compete against the the foreign athletes, um, then you are like, okay, no one did it before. Why should I try? Or then uh, maybe this is also some uh, intergenerational change that is happening. That I see that the young, at least in Portugal, the, the young uh, athletes, they 
they feel so good when they win some race in Portugal or they did some some training and they post it on, on Strava or whatever and they're like trying to show off in, in some way. And I'm, when I see this, I, I feel like, why? Why do you do this? Why don't? Why can't you train and do your stuff because you, you like it and not to show that you are doing it and really trying to get better? Maybe I'm being a bit like old fashioned guy in the in this topic, but when <laughs> when when I when I like when I, when I was younger and I was training hard, I I didn't post it. I when I had some really good race, I didn't I didn't I I wouldn't go to Instagram and share it like hey I had super nice race. So yeah, maybe the, that's the way the younger generation is living now. That yeah, it's good to. I, to I was going it. to say that you sound like me. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, but maybe. I'm 41. You're 22. So <laughs> I was, I was like in my head, and I, I was thinking that you are in this generation. <laughs> yeah, but it's like it's already maybe like five, six year gap to to these younger younger guys. And I, I have a younger sister, so I know what I'm what I'm talking about. Um, yeah, I think they should try to focus really on enjoying the process of training and uh, getting better or just like enjoying the orienteering by itself. They don't need to maybe get better or they don't need to try to be national champion or top 10 in AYOC. They That's should, like, yeah, just really don't, enjoy don't it. Don't do it for show. Yeah, do it for yeah exactly. Exactly. Just, just enjoy it. <sighs> true. Absolutely true. <laughs> Very cool topic. Um, okay. So when you, when you joined the junior national team, uh, your opportunities for training uh, are a, uh, a lot better they expand yeah, i think so um but what is portugal missing in your head of course and I, I realize that you're probably not an expert on this but maybe you have your own thoughts regarding this what is portugal missing in general to produce a world-class senior athlete that would be able to compete during world orienting champs and you know regularly place let's say in top 10 yeah first i think to to be a top athlete and place high in the rankings outside of portugal first you, you have to be a bit crazy i think every top athlete has to be a bit crazy they have to be willing to suffer to 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 put some other stuff aside and to focus totally on this but of course maybe this is not enough you need maybe a strong group to be training with you to be like pushing you and of course you need someone i would say that has been in this position before some older guy that has been um competing at this level at least or trying that knows how it feels and that person can help you or coach you and portugal has never had such an athlete um we i think we have some people that are really experienced in orienteering they they know so much about it and um for example bruno uh i think you you have interviewed him yeah he's he knows so much about orienteering um but still maybe you need someone that was an athlete and really was trying to to fight those those top guys and knows exactly what it takes even not not just physically, also mentally, because I think orienteering is so much about about the mind, about uh, small details that in Portugal we don't know about. Maybe some 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 helpful tips to to help you keep focused during the whole whole race or something like this. So we we don't know this, and maybe we need someone to teach us this. I would say it's maybe just my thought. I don't know if it's really this. Then, of course, having uh, available maps to train all year round close to you. Uh, I, I mean, in Portugal, we have really good maps, uh, but they are usually in some rural areas that you have to travel there and you have to be willing to waste, the not waste, of course, but spend the full weekend uh, doing this. And then I think also, of course, we have sometimes good athletes until juniors, but then when you get to senior, you lose almost everyone because of university, I would say. There is no support from universities to the top sport. At least, of course, you if you are a football player, you will get so much money from the football that you can do the studies in 10 years. Um, <laughs> but when you are an orienteer, you have no support at all. 
uh, even sometimes if you ask to postpone some exam for you they won't do it so this can be really tricky and some people just say yeah, I won't do it like orienteering is just a hobby it's not something that I will earn money from I need to get yeah. something to 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 earn the money so yeah they define their priorities and of course I think it's safer to go for the for the studies instead of the orienteering true well um very nice thoughts uh, I'll comment on, on some of those. So you said mm. that people need to be a little bit crazy, uh, like the pain, but that, that involves just simply, you know, hard training. So this is, you know, what uh, all top athletes need to do outside of orienteering basically as well. So you don't have to be an orienteer really. Mm -hmm. But I think it's, not, it's nicely connected with the last one that you've mentioned. So um, no support from, from universities and also no possibilities really to be a professional athlete, meaning getting paid for doing orienteering, right? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, if, if the, to be a student, uh, so the person that is going into studies had a choice, do I go to studies or do I start my professional orienteering career? And, you know, here I'm going to be studying for some years and then I'm going to be earning money. Here I will be earning money as a sports person and I'm not wasting my time over here, not wasting my years then I think that maybe this choice would be a little bit better and easier to make for some athletes, you know? And, I'm, and I guess that this is a problem for many countries, not of course just Portugal, because mm -hmm. many are struggling with this, but that definitely helps if you have like financial means to support yourself as a professional athlete. And I'm always in awe listening and talking to people who are competing at a very high level and still doing, you know, their their daily jobs. This really amazes me. I'm I'm, I'm always fascinated by this. Uh, training in a group. You've also mentioned this one. I totally agree uh, because group always helps, especially if you're not the best in the group and you have someone to um, grow up to. Uh, so that's helpful. Then you said that. This is actually, so, so the maps is another point that I agree and you have wonderful maps in Portugal. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is not a big problem, I think. But I'm not sure if I agree with the, you know, having someone successful to look up to, to give you tips. Um, because if we would agree that this is one of the requirements, you know what that means? N no future countries could get there yeah exactly yeah. you would never get there yeah but i would uh, when when i said this it's not about maybe looking up it's maybe coaching you in this mental side or yeah how can i put this into words it's like having someone to show you a way to get there at least or um be be with you daily to to show you how how it can be done yeah um I don't know, of course, you, you can try your own way and you, probably you can be successful with this. But again, you have to be really strong minded. And um, and then, yeah, when you have some some obstacle in your way, you can start feeling bad about it and not being able to push on. Um, so having this person by your side or at least coaching you and um, yeah, sh showing you that it's possible it's it's always a bit harder i would say but of course it's 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 maybe pos it's it's of course possible to do it but again maybe a bit harder i'll give you an interesting perspective so i have never been a top athlete in mm. orienteering and i've never represented the country for example during world orienteering champs so like if i would to be agree to if I would to agree with you, it, that would basically mean that I cannot coach people that aim for higher goals in sport, and I think that is that is not true. And I'm not saying it because of me, because for example, Bruno that you mentioned, I think that he would be a great person to help such athletes as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't want what you said to sound like an excuse that okay we don't have top level athletes therefore it will be hard for us to get to the top level because a very simple solution to this is go and talk with top level athletes mm -hmm. go and mm -hmm. talk with their coaches it's like 
there's no one stopping you from doing that yeah yeah and, I, and I've, I've been doing it like i'm i'm in czech exactly. republic like now and i've i've, I've i'm friend with the uh, for example milos nikodim jonas ubacek and they they help me they certainly do but exactly right it's, so it's maybe not on on the daily basis that i would need or like i would maybe need to move here i don't know but okay i have always been coached by my dad and i think we have achieved some really great stuff together mm -hmm. um he's for me until now he has been the perfect coach but i i think that i'm missing something to get the next step I don't, I don't know maybe someone to teach me the other part or like to train me for the other side because of course my father knows how to coach uh, athletics and uh, even orienteering uh, but not maybe to the really top level that I would need for the for the next step I don't know um, maybe I'm not being able to put this into into the right words I, I know what uh, you mean I know what mm -hmm. you mean let's let's make an experiment mm -hmm. I'll give you access to the orienteering academy that I did or it was the, the, the first part of this year mm -hmm. and there are some videos over there that you will have to watch so you can you know watch them whenever you want mm -hmm. uh, it will take you probably a couple of weeks to go through this mm -hmm. and after this let me know if this was a different perspective did it introduce something new to you, to your orienteering or not? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm 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 pretty sure it will not be a waste of your time because no, at not. the very least, at the very least, you will simply refresh some of the concepts. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm just curious how how many new things you will you will actually learn from it. And you know, I have been talking even through this channel, uh, but not only with a lot of top level athletes around the world and i'm pretty sure that the content that is over there is consistent with what i'm hearing from those people so i think it's world class okay and i wonder what what you will think about it mm -hmm. right okay so okay. i'll, I'll, I'll give you access after, after thank the you. chat thank and you. let's let's see if if you can get something something out of it hopefully mm -hmm. this will be helpful yeah anyway let's carry on let's carry on so a very interesting topic uh, regarding uh, the seniors, but let's close this and let's jump to the next one, which mm -hmm. is for me personally even more exciting. So your your speaker gig at the, at the Jaywalk, and I'm excited about it because I like to talk about different occupations that people have, their different jobs and the quirks of those jobs, mm -hmm. and this one sounds really interesting to me. Uh, when I think about it, I, I immediately think that there are very um, th th there is a lot of unique challenges that come with being a, a good speaker. Mm -hmm. So I yeah. don't know if I even mean, know where where to start and what question to throw at you. So just you know, tell yeah, me what yeah. you think about it, and I'll maybe follow up with some questions later. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got, I got the invitation to be speaker by by Bruno. He was like the the main speaker. So yeah, he gave me this this opportunity also because I think I was so close to the age of the juniors that were competing that year. I was just one year outside the, the junior class. So I knew, I would say everyone um, or at least the top athletes. Um, so I would be kind of expert commentator on, on, on the athletes themselves. So what I did was like, I think, three or four weeks prior to the the jaywalk i i went through the uh eventor seeing who is um, entered for the for the for the competition and i would write everything i knew about that person i would i would search for them in the world athletics try to see their pbs on the 3000 1500 i would maybe check their uh, social media if it was uh, public so i got uh, notes about everyone i had like a book and during like when I had some free time, I would like, I don't know, spend two or three hours a day doing this uh, research. So then in the end, I had quite a big book, um, like with, yeah, with the PBs, uh, prior good results. Even I, I, I was searching the results of Yukolas and Teomilas as well, like seeing how well they performed there so that I could have really good insight on, on everyone. Um, yeah. And I think I, I achieved this quite well because of course you can do 
we we also had another speaker paulo and he did this research in which he like he's a really good informatics so he just put in an excel like he downloaded all the results in prior um world ranking uh competitions but then this doesn't give you all the insight about that person maybe some prior injuries as well i searched for this so yeah th this was the first um first step i would say just to get really know like know everyone in in the in the race so then because during the the live stream it's about content it's about being always active every all the time every something to say because for example during the long distance there are a lot of dead times like exactly. where nothing is happening so you you need to throw some stuff in even if it's not the most exciting if you have some some data about the all the people it's i think it's much more interesting and then the the people watching at home they are like wow the they they know about for example my son that is competing there that's that's so interesting um so yeah and then i think it's about the harmony between the speakers because you, usually you don't have just one and i think we achieved it quite well with the three speakers we were i think yeah bruno was like the guy doing really the cheering and like this emotional speaking and then me and paulo we were like sometimes throwing some stuff in and uh, of course bruno would get tired sometimes so we would jump in a bit more on this on this period um and all in all i think it was such a great experience i i really enjoyed it um sometimes it was yeah demanding because i was also setting out controls and taking them out so it was like full day of work and then also changing arenas um so for me it was one of the greatest experiences ever uh, and i also got invited to be speaker in romania this year mm -hmm. for for jwoc but I had the school and again with the injury, I was not so motivated for orienteering and I was like, I, I don't want to be there when seeing all those juniors run so well when I'm in so so bad shape. Oh, that's uh, a but yeah, then I regret, I think I regretted it a bit because it was so nice and Bruno was there again, we could have done a good job together. But yeah, it was, it was great. Yeah, I, I was just going to ask, you know, the question whether do you, you think it it would make sense to have like a speakers that are present on those jwoc competitions year after year and you know in my head the answer is obvious it, it has to be beneficial yes. because they like they, they don't have to do the research from the very beginning every mm -hmm. time they already know some of the athletes they already even interviewed some of them personally you know and uh, many of them will be returning to the same competition year after year mm -hmm. until they mm -hmm. go out of the junior class so it sounds like something that uh, definitely would be very helpful. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, I think for me, it was also very nice because, as I said, I was just one year older than the guys competing. So I knew them. And yeah, one, one thing I forgot to mention is that also, I think I tried to mess message at least one person from each team before the race. And so to this person, I was like asking, like, who is most like in best shape, who has the highest goals? how is the team connection like yeah how how they are bound together so i also tried to since i was close to many of these of these guys competing it was easy to do this so i think when you when you have someone that can do this and i mean everyone can but when you are so so close together to the to them it's much easier so yeah, yeah. I, I absolutely agree that if you have someone that has been commenting in the, in the juniors they, they will of course always know what's what's coming next and it's easier to do the research do you remember who you contacted from the polish team Oof. i don't know maybe maybe anna anna sudo anna sudo she's maybe, very but... she's she's a very outgoing person <laughs> yeah yeah exactly and i i know her from from before but yeah I, i'm not sure maybe because who sorry I, I don't remember who who you had competing there but yeah, maybe i also contacted uh, piotrek rzenka i don't Renza. know to, yeah yeah because i know him from from aox before yeah. um so i think i think i messaged him actually yeah okay that, yeah. that's another good source yes <laughs> <laughs> that's another good source uh how much time do you think that the whole research took it must have been uh, like yeah as i said hours. It, it was like three weeks before four weeks um i don't know maybe two days yeah, total because then i was having a friend helping me we were just we would just go on discord together and we would chat and 
Uh -huh. he, he would do one team, I would do the other, and he was like going a bit ahead of me. So then when I got to this team, he would already have some data. Uh, so we were doing kind of teamwork. So yeah, I also have to thank him for that. <laughs> it, was, it was great help. Cool. And what, what about the voice? Did you have problems with the voice while doing the speaking? Mm, no, because I was not doing the, maybe the screaming like as as bruno I, I remember bruno in the in the sprint relay in the in the summer he totally lost his voice yeah so before <laughs> before the the prize giving ceremony he was doing some sing, trying to sing a bit like to refresh the voice and he was drinking i don't know if it was tea with honey or something trying to get the voice back so i i think i even have some video of him singing in the backstage trying to get the voice <laughs> back but yeah I, I didn't lose the voice but of course then it's also about the, I think the English word is intuition, you could maybe. So in the beginning, I was maybe a bit more nervous and I wasn't like maybe speaking so clearly or I was speaking maybe too low. But then as you as you go and as the time goes by, you just forget about this and you just feel more comfortable doing doing what you're doing that is speaking to so many people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've asked about it because um, I'm sometimes... Uh, I sometimes do the training sessions. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that's what, what my company does. We're doing the training and consulting. So sometimes when I'm doing the training, I feel like, you know, four hours of speaking to people with some short breaks in between are not that comfortable for my, for my throat. And I'm usually speaking, you know, not very loud and trying to save my voice. Not mm -hmm. like Bruno did during during the competitions when you have to be emotional. Sometimes you have to raise your voice. You have yeah. to almost shout sometimes, you know, to 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 get this energy to the listeners, which he did beautifully. It, it was yeah. amazing to listen to, uh, but it does destroy the voice. I I remember, you know, his 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 voice, for example, in the morning and then during the prize giving ceremony <laughs> at the end of the competition. Yeah, exactly. And, and we were, I think I was drinking so much water during during the, the whole morning of, of races. And also tea. We, we had a lot of tea with honey and uh, coffee as well, because you had to stay energetic. So all of these, I think it helps. And yeah, maybe water is the best to, to keep going through through it. Nice. All right. So I'm happy to hear that you've enjoyed it. Uh, I did. I, did. Um, I, I, I was going to say that... Um, you should definitely repeat it again, but you rejected the, <laughs> the offer from the Romanian. Yeah, maybe, maybe I shouldn't. Have done it. Yeah, um, yeah you, you did a very good job, definitely. Yeah, so it was like from the spectate, spectator that I was, uh, it was really nice to follow the whole event. All right, so uh, let's go to the last bit. Uh, we still have a little bit of time and talk about the experience of running for a club from another country. So uh, there are several things I'm interested in over here. First of all, how do you get to a club in Scandinavia, maybe in general? How, would you, how did you approach this? Uh, did you like copy the, the things that your friends did maybe uh, on, on, on higher level in the, in the national team? And um, what are, what, what is the difference in conditions between you know what you have in your sports club in Portugal and what you have in MS Parma and how beneficial it is to the runner in general. So sorry, a lot of questions, but I can repeat them later. Yeah, yeah maybe. <laughs> yeah, okay. So I think for me, it was a bit easier because uh, this guy that I mentioned before, Ricardo, he had some really good results from AOC and JWOC. He was already in MS Parma. And he was always kind of my mentor inside the national team and in the orienteering world. So it was through him and his coach, Pedro. They contacted the, the, like the team manager in, in Parma and they sent my curriculum that, to them. Like I, of course, I did my own sports curriculum. Um, and it was in 2019, I think. No, 2018, we started doing this, like this um, conversation with the team manager. Um, so yeah, basically it was through Ricardo. So by having Ricardo telling to the team manager in Parma that I was good and that I had the potential, that certainly helped a lot. Um, so when I finally got the news that I was being accepted at least 
to go on a training camp there to Finland and that they would pay my flight. That for me, that it meant the world. Um, and it was at the time that I was starting to have the struggle with the knee. Uh, so it was something that boosted my my confidence and I was even more willing to come back to, to training. Um, so yeah, then first experience there was was great. I was not expecting to feel so so well already in my first time in Scandinavia. No, actually, it was second time. I had been in Norway before with some Erasmus uh, project. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it was um, it was great, and they liked my performances there on the first training camp. So they said that they wanted to keep working on me. So after that, there was the COVID. So there was kind of sort of a break, but we always kept in contact. Um, so now every year I've been going there for at least one camp. And then of course, Tio Mila and Yukola. Um, sometimes I'm not going because I'm injured or it's not the best timing. Uh, but overall, I think they, I mean, I, I am so grateful for the, to them because they have been help supporting financially all my travels there. Uh, they have been paying for the for the flights and then all the accommodation costs there, and that coming from Portugal that that means really a lot. Um, and even even supporting with uh, training camps that I'm doing outside of Finland, they they have been doing this, and that's uh, come on for a guy from Portugal that that means the world really. Um, and then being just being there and doing what they do on a weekly basis on going to the forest every day training in these amazing forests um you feel like you are kind of a pro athlete for at least one or two weeks and you are really focusing on it um so it's it's i think it's always refreshing when you are so long in portugal at least during the winter and then you finally have some break in Finland to really just focus on orienteering yeah it's it I think it boosts you to uh, another level awesome awesome very good to hear um, um do, do you like when you when you do the trainings with mm -hmm. the with the Parma sports club do you see that there is like a different level of organization i guess i would i would have to say of the training camp uh like does uh, where where does this professional feeling come from why do you feel like i, a professional I, I think it there? comes from from being there just for orienteering because when you are at home you always have something else you what about what about know, training something. camps in portugal they, they are quite quite okay but i mean you are still in your own country and you are maybe together with people that are that you know for long mm -hmm. and then when you are outside and you are with people that are maybe they are even not so trying so hard but at least you are with someone that you don't see so often and you want to try to show that you are improving and that i think it's about the environment surrounding it maybe it's just some mental trick but it's about being there just for that, just for the orienteering, just to work on your skills there. And then, of course, the level, because you are competing with guys that do orienteering since they are young and almost every every week. So, of course, they are better than maybe your training partners in, in Portugal. So that also boosts you. And then, of course, all the competitions that you do outside, like in Finland, I've, I've done some national champs. Um, and the level is just totally the amazingly different like i i've run some some national champs and if i was racing in portugal maybe i would have won the race by 10 minutes and in finland i'm getting smashed by 20 minutes in a long distance and it's <laughs> it's just the level of, of competition and uh, yes yes yeah. that's what that's what i've been talking about earlier actually getting back to this i i made a note regarding this uh, and training in a group because i feel like and and I was wondering if you've had that sometime during your career, possibly several times, when you you feel like okay, I'm running with the map and I feel like I'm doing a good job, and then suddenly you go either to a training camp or to a competition where uh, you get to meet people that are better than you, 
mm -hmm. then you get to run with them during a race. It, it can be a training race, but you're running with racing speed. It can be like a competition where somebody catches up to you or you're lucky enough to catch up to someone that is actually a little bit better than you, mm -hmm. and you and you run together. And then you can, thanks to this experience, uh, I've noticed that you can run to several realizations. You can, for example, notice that, oh, I can actually run faster and still be able to read the map. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing that sometimes people say that they are able to discover. Another one is that, you know, simply by observing uh, another person, they can uh, draw some conclusions regarding the type of navigation. And, you know, mm -hmm. I don't maybe have to look at the map so often because this person doesn't. So apparently it's possible. Or maybe I can use a lot of a lot, a lot more of my compass because these guys were looking at the compass all the time. Things like these. Did, did, you, did you have these kind of moments, yeah, realizations? Yeah, certainly. And I think one of them that maybe impacted me the most was, I think maybe, I think it was last year on the Tio Miller camp that we had in Sweden. We were doing, it was kind of easy training. Um, and at that time I was running fast. I, I was in really good shape. And there was a, a teammate from the club that was not in so good shape, of course. Um, and still during the training, I was maybe trying to go a bit faster. And I was doing some small mistakes, like always, I don't know, 20, 30 seconds mistake. But this was enough for him to always catch me on the control. Mm -hmm. So I was like, what, what am I doing? Like, I'm, I'm running so much faster than him and he's going in this slow pace and perfectly to the control. So then I realized that when you are at this level, you really have to be precise with the orienteering. You cannot be mi missing always 10, 15 seconds in every control. Yeah. Um, and yeah, by all the experiences, especially in relays, running, running fast with other guys, you, it's like you said, you realize that you can go faster then maybe you you usually do in a individual individual race. Yeah, I actually I had a discussion yesterday with mm -hmm. my bro brother uh, regarding the Polish champs that we had just the previous weekend, mm -hmm. and I'm going to share the map with you uh, just to share the window. It's going to be this one. So just to give you and everyone else watching uh, an idea regarding, you know, how the map looked like mm -hmm. that we we're running on. So this was the map. It's very close to the sea. So it's like sand dunes. Um, like, no, like some Portuguese terrains, I would say. A little bit. Yeah, sometimes. Because you also have a lot of sand dune terrains, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, especially like towards Lisbon and... and yeah, by, by the ocean. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so not a very difficult terrain, especially with the amount of roads and paths that you can see over here mm -hmm. no big hills um, not a lot of green areas so essentially this kind of orienteering uh, when you are able to execute it quite well it's pretty simple you know and we were having a discussion um, regarding the fact that maybe it's too simple for national championship and that that was my initial comment uh, mm -hmm. But then uh, we, or I came to, to the re realization of discussing it with my brother that actually this can be quite interesting from time to time. And it's good to have a mix of difficult terrains, very difficult terrains, and also easy terrains, because in those easy terrains, different things matter a little bit more mm -hmm. and you can still learn a lot from it. So this kind of race, you know, I've been executing it perfectly all the way until 18th which is like mm -hmm. a pit that i that i missed but mm -hmm. because the, the 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 forest is so fast and everybody is able to run with basically almost full speed then first of all you realize of course this is obvious that you need to be quite fast to be able to to win but at the same time you cannot really count on um making even small mistakes and getting away with it because yeah. the top top 10 in the results will be, for example, one minute apart. So mm -hmm. if, you, if you make 15 seconds of a mistake, it might cost you three places in the general classification. Mm -hmm. So it kind of uh, gets you to the conclusion that every mistake matters. And yeah. I know that it's obvious on an on elite level, but on junior level, sometimes it, it's not. You know, mm -hmm. and people make 
15 second mistakes and they don't even realize that there was a mistake on the leg so yeah. it is definitely beneficial to realize that and be able to understand it and improve upon it yeah and, and i would say that in in such fast terrains you, you always feel like okay i have to run fast otherwise i would i won't win and when you are always having this thought you, you are going to miss somewhere so it's also about knowing for example when you start feeling more tired to the end of the race knowing when to slow down and because you know you realize okay i'm getting tired i will most certainly miss this next control and so many times during the race i've had this thought but still i don't slow down and then i miss and i, I remember from this year university european champs in in switzerland we had kind of transition leg in the middle distance it was quite i think it was the easiest control on the race but right from the beginning i was like you are going to miss this control i i i had this feeling and even having it i still missed the control by two minutes and i was doing perfect race until there um so i think i lost like 15 positions just just because of this mistake on i think third last control uh -huh. so this this is maybe one of the things that I, I was talking about before that having someone to tell you these tips that like someone that has been at this level and will tell you how to approach this kind of situation um of course when when you do it then you will know next time but if, maybe if you knew it a bit more beforehand it, it wouldn't be so bad um, so I, I actually think that that's not true that if you do it no. once you won't do it next time yeah, yeah but yeah I, I've, I've done it more than one time so. exactly exactly <laughs> i'm sure you did and i i you know i have the same kind of sense almost every race when you whenever mm -hmm. i make a mistake i know I, I did it before i've been running or anything for 20 years you know mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. even though i'm analyzing the races and trying to learn from it it's sometimes extremely hard to make the right decision in this um moment when everything is hot everything is super mm -hmm. intense and mm -hmm. you're trying to be as good as possible and even the race i've been sharing over here you know it's, it's been like perfect race until the last two controls yeah. and i felt mm -hmm. like i saw that the last two controls are in the pits so it's, mm -hmm. it's not going to be easy they, they are not going to be uh visible from from afar i, I need to hit them perfectly but at the same time i felt that if i don't speed up i don't have the chance yeah. of winning the race and mm -hmm. that was my goal i wanted to win the race otherwise mm -hmm. you know the rest that didn't really matter so despite you know feeling that these are difficult controls and maybe i should tackle them a little bit cautiously i actually instead of slowing down i sped up <laughs> and that's and that's yeah. how i missed them and, and i i have a really good friend and 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 she says that whenever i don't feel confident i stop and it it makes sense but when you are running the race you don't want to stop yes <laughs> so and she she does it and she does perfect races and i feel maybe because we are men and we are like oh yeah i don't need to to slow down i uh, i can do this perfectly and then you don't stop and you lose much more time than if you had stopped for just to check exactly where you are or what, where you have to go next yeah so maybe I, I don't it's also... think it has anything to do with with the gender i think it's just yeah, uh, yeah of the, course the, the mindset yeah. that you have before the yeah. race yeah um i'm actually talking about this in the orientering academy as well so i think you mm -hmm. will you will be able to okay, hear okay. my thoughts nice. uh, regarding this mm -hmm. all right last two things that i want to ask um you're currently still doing studies right you're not working yeah yeah still, still what studying. are you studying uh, i'm studying biomedical engineering in, in my hometown so yeah, that that's a good point that I could stay at home and uh, not having to move to a different city because maybe that can be a bit trickier if you want to still train hard. And did you think about moving to Scandinavia, for example? I did, uh, maybe two, three years ago, even doing some Erasmus. But then I was sometime in some training camp in Finland in September, and it was so cold. Yeah. And like coming from South Europe straight to some Scandinavian country where you will have to tackle the winter. I was like, nah, man, I would rather come here more often during the summer or something like this. So uh, I'm already in my fifth year. I'm already in complete. I will start fifth year now. So I will have to write the thesis. Uh -huh. And 
I would I would uh, come to Czech Czech Republic for the second semester. So I think that's that's a good um, halfway point to be. I'm I'm not so far away as Portugal. Yeah. I will be in a country that has good or interior culture already and a lot of races, and it's much closer to Finland. So maybe I can go there more often. That's true. Yeah. Uh, and having I think uh, walk 2025 will be in in Finland. So. I will want to go there much more often and even maybe do a longer stay there during summer or something like this, maybe next year. So yeah, that's, that's the goal. Sounds good. Last one. Uh, mm -hmm. What is, in your opinion, the most important orienteering skill? Skill? Yes. Ooh. I've, I've, I've learned something from one Portuguese older guy that is, you, you have to find your the running speed in which you can always keep in contact with the map and that can change for different terrain for different moments in the race um so i would say is realizing what is the right speed for each part of the race for each terrain because if you are running at this speed in which you can always keep contact with the map you will not miss and also i've I've learned something from another good friend um artyom from he, he was running for parma and and he told me orienteering is so easy you just have to you just need to have a strategy for each control and basically you do that 20 times in a race like between each control there is one goal that is finding the next control yes and you have one attack point you have your root choice there and it's about repeating this 20 times in a race so it's it's so easy and and when you think about it that's true <laughs> but then exactly. of course doing it it's 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 much harder so yes so i i always say like that there is like a set of skills that that you should have but actually to be uh, able to hit the controls perfectly you mm -hmm. need just a handful of them and you yeah. usually acquire those skills when you're running in your 12th and 14th categories already. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, all it comes down to later on is to be able to combine them together to execute mm -hmm. them at the full speed possible. And, yeah. that, and, and, that's I, the and I think it's about being able to learn at least something with everyone that does orienteering. Even it's trying, it's about being humble. And sometimes you can learn something from a kid that is just starting orienteering and he's, he has some idea in his mind that he will tell this to, to you and you're like, oh, I didn't realize this. This is actually a good strategy to approach orienteering or at least the navigation. Um, so it's about learning a bit from everyone. I, I also had another friend from Parma that told me before a relay, we were going to have a relay champs and I was running, I think, second leg. And he just told to me before the race, don't try too hard because I felt at that moment that I was just really like, ah, I have to run fast. I have to be good. I have to pay attention to everything. And he just said, said to me, don't try too hard. Like don't be a hero and just do, do what, what you have to do in each control. I did that. And I did perfect race. I was like, wow, <laughs> sometimes I, maybe I don't have to worry so much and I just have to go with how I feel there. And yeah, so this this he, maybe he doesn't even remember that he told this to me, but it ke it kept echoing in my mind since then. Like, don't don't try too hard, and I I still remember the exact moment he, he told this to me. So it's it's kind of funny. Perfect, a, yeah. a wonderful finish to our conversation. Thank yeah. you so much, Tomas. It was uh, a pleasure hosting you over here on the channel. Hopefully, everyone else listening had fun uh, as much as I did listening to the conversation. And we will end it right here. Thank you so much. Thank you. See you.